Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on when you watch this video. Again, uh, today, Father Daniel and I thought we would talk about our chalices, these beautiful vessels on which the blood, uh, the wine, sorry, becomes the precious blood of our Lord. Um, traditionally, the chalice, when a priest gets ordained, it's a gift from uh, his family. We are both blessed to have families, families whom we love immensely and who love us immensely as well. And so they did give us chalices. Uh, as you can see, they are different. They are both absolutely beautiful, according to me, of course. So I'm going to let Father talk about his first, and then I'll talk a little bit about mine as well. So as, as you can see, both of these chalices standing next to each other, they're both, chalices are always built to be sturdy, so that in case you accidentally knocked one of them over, or you'd have a, uh, it'd take a lot of force to actually totally knock one over because of the preciousness of the contents of the chalice, right? Our Lord's precious blood. And so they're built to be very sturdy. And most chalices have kind of four components to it, a base, a cup, a shaft, which is more prominently displayed on his chalice, and then a node. And these have various meanings in themselves. We probably won't go into them today. As you can see on my chalice, this comes from um, a time of the 1100s, 1200s, or 1300s. It's called the Romanesque period of art, depending on where in the continent of uh, Europe you are and how late it took for these art movements to get to them. Um, this was a time in the church when uh, the physical uh, building of the church took a role of being the center of life and, and even a place of protection. So when barbarian tribes would come in, uh, everyone would come and huddle in the church for protection. And the walls of those churches were really thick. It was a stout. It was seen as a time where the church was a refuge for the people. And so therefore, you have an architecture style that's... that's um, stout, sturdy walls, which doesn't leave a lot of room for uh, stained glass. It doesn't leave a lot of room for height. And so that's one of a couple of reasons why Father Umberto's chalice is higher than mine, just because in these centuries, they were, they were talking about structure and sturdiness in a lot of different things. And so you have this chalice that along the bottom has um, the four gospel writers. You have Matthew the angel, uh, you have, going the other way, you have Luke, the evangelist. You have uh, Mark as a lion. And you have John as an eagle. Now, since my favorite gospel is Luke, I have crowned two jewels on the side. They're diamonds. This is a diamond that my grandfather uh, gave to my grandmother, and this is a diamond that my father gave to my mother so that I would always pray for them, especially at the consecration. And so um, it's a common thing if there are family jewels for those to be uh, encrusted in the chalice itself. Then you have this node that serves a practical purpose of stability, of, of having something to hold on to. Uh, and this is decorated um, in just a certain decorative style, which is ornate enough. When I bought the chalice, they say that oftentimes what a, what a few people will do is at their 10-year or 20-year anniversary, priests will switch out the node for maybe a more precious stone that they were not able to have earlier, um, which is just a cool, with this type of chalice, which is a cool thing that I haven't really considered yet. Along the sides of the chalice, you have the 12 apostles, along with different things that um, identify them. Um, and so the gospel writers will have, uh, that's probably Matthew, since he's holding a, um, uh, a book, You'll have Peter, who's got the keys. You'll have John, who has a scroll. And then I would have to do a little bit more research as to who is all the rest on here. Um, one last thing to note on this. This is all silver-plated, yet the interior is gold. And the interior is gold because the things of, at least according to the spirituality of this chalice, the things of God, or the more precious things, pertain to God. And so since this is the part that touches me, it's silver. 
Since this is the part that touches God, it's gold. And so that's kind of how this chalice is constructed. It's a really beautiful chalice. I love it both up close and from afar, which is one of the reasons why uh, I discerned that I wanted it to be my chalice. On the left, we have a chalice that is built um, a little differently. As Father mentioned, it is taller than his because while the focus uh, during the era of the Romanesque architecture is structure, the focus of the Gothic architecture style is go high, 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 as high as you can, uh, trying to touch what is heavenly. Um, not is in the t as in the Tower of Babel, but rather just aspiring for the things on high. And uh, prime examples of this type of architecture, of course, are the Notre Dame uh, Cathedral and uh, even the cathedral here at the Archdiocese of Denver. If you go uh, there, you can uh, experience what Gothic architecture is supposed to look like. Uh, now, closer to home, if you come to the Adoration Chapel, the altarpiece behind the Eucharist is completely uh, in, uh, constructed in Gothic style. So that's why, again, this chalice is a little taller than this one. Now, mine has three medallions only. Uh, this one is, uh, and, and I don't know if you can see the detail, you would have to be, I think, right here in order to uh, see it very clearly. This is the birth of our Lord, so Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus in very fine uh, uh, work detail. Um, here is the Lord, the resurrection of the Lord, what we are celebrating uh, these days. Uh, and right here is the ascension of our Lord. So during uh, or uh, ordinary time, there's this cross, and so that's how I celebrate Mass, with the cross pointing to me. Uh, during Christmas time, obviously, I have this medallion that I look at as I am consecrating, and uh, the ascension, and then during this time of Easter, it is this medallion that I have uh, looking towards me. The detail on it, uh, it's also very, very ornate. In, in, in every little piece of the chalice. From here down, there is uh, decorate. there are decorations, and a lot of them, like right here, the windows, if you will, and right here as well, are completely Gothic, so you can uh, very clearly distinguish that. And uh, you can also compare these to the stands of Mary and Joseph, when you're able to come back to church or to the kneeler uh, in front of the pews and you'll see that it is uh, um, gothic in style. And our cameraman has pointed out, if you want to come look over here, this is an exact style replica. This catrafoil and high and then pointedness, this exact design is replicated right here. See how perfectly it matches? That is gothic at its best. Um, so, just one more thing and very important to me, as I said, uh, traditionally the chalices and the patents are given to us by our families. I engraved mine here. Uh, the engraving says, Padre Humberto Marquez. And then it says, Ordination 514, so May 14, 2005. That's the anniversary of my ordination. And right here, uh, in Spanish, Regalo de mi familia, a gift of my family. So every time I consecrate, every time I celebrate Mass, I make sure that I have my family present, that I pray for them at the most important uh, moment of the Mass. At the top of this one, I have, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands. 
which is one of the lines directly from Eucharistic Prayer 1. And then at the bottom it says, Donum vitae a familia sua, a gift of life from his family. So commemorating that my family has gifted me this chalice, and that not the chalice itself is a gift of life, but that the precious blood of Jesus is life-giving. And then it says, Father Daniel Chuchi, ordained May 13th, and then M-M-X-V-I-I, -I, which I'm going to let you homeschool families or Googlers figure out what year that is. M-M-X-V-I-I, -I, that was the year of my ordination, and that's the bottom of our chalices. The last thing is this, uh, why, why such precious gifts? Are we worthy of them? Well, no, but again, it's because of what we are celebrating. One thing to note of, of much importance is this, the chalice can never be uh, made, especially this part, the cup, with any material that is porous. It has to be completely smooth, and, and generally, uh, most of the time, it is gold-plated. That way, when we purify the chalice, there is no uh, chance of any particle of the precious blood being neglected. Uh, and so, when we purify it, it's, all the blood is cleaned uh, from it. Which is a really good point. I think a lot of people come and they quote that part from Indiana Jones, whichever one it is, mm. and they're like, which is the chalice of a carpenter? And they like point to some dinky wood one, um, or a clay or something like that. And, and a lot of people, when they quote it to us, will be kind of um, dismissive of us as our priesthood, or even laced with this accusation of us um, kind of gilded in fine clothing and touching gold things all the time that we live this kind of bourgeoisie, aristocracy, whatever, um, and that we think the people of God stink, right? Um, when, we have, when we have this, um, when we have these things, the things that pertain to God are the things that should be elevated the highest, right? It's not because of us, and, and if, you, if you look at us in, in normal day life, right, I have the, my closet really has not changed in, uh, 10 years, um, because the, th the things of God are to be elevated, right? What we wear in our daily life is not, we don't wear crowns, we don't wear um, elegant things like that. Uh, we take on a life of simplicity. Um, but when it comes to the things of God, where in possible we get the best within the means for God's glorification. And our proximity to those things is not for our own glorification, but because of the call that we have received from God. Amen. Amen. Thank you.